Hey guys, sorry, no cute, funny intro this time. Um, I wanted to let everyone know before the actual recording starts that uh, the audio for this ended up really, really jank. Um, I normally would have just actually trashed this episode if it was just like another YA uh, semi-romance book, but um, the discussion I we are really proud of in this one, actually, and, and it's also the first part of a two-part um, series. Uh, we're doing the first book and a half and then the second book. Um, and a half in the next one. So don't feel obligated to listen to this. But yeah, also don't comment that the audio is bad. We know. <laughs> All right, here we go. Hi, guys, and welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast, Unresolved Textual Tension. It's me, your host, Maria. And today I am digitally joined by two of my handsome bitches. William and Katie. And you may have noticed that we're recording a little bit different today, and that's because the vagaries of mach the machine spirit mean that our normal way of recording just didn't work for some reason, um, which is very annoying. Now, usually, usually, Maria is the one who dresses up every once in a while for this podcast, right? Today, I dressed up. We're doing which series, Maria? The Southern Reach trilogy by, I don't know. Jeff Vandermeer. Back to my main important point. Usually, Maria is the one who dresses up for these podcasts. Today, I decide to dress up in my best fatigue, vaguely military outfit. The both army fatigue and janitorial. I used to call this my uh, Soviet Russian um, mercenary jacket, but in light of recent events, I'm just calling it my post-Soviet block jacket. Um, and ladies, you gotta say in the comments just how handsome I look. I know it's there. So handsome. But as Maria was saying it, earlier, it looks more like the uniforms in the movie Annihilation, which we're gonna be comparing to the book series because yes, this series is the one from which Annihilation with Natalie Portman uh, was based on. Um, which is an awful, awful movie. As someone who had never read the book, and it's still awful, times a million now that i've read the book maria what are your thoughts on this matter i didn't think the movie was awful it just for me was an entirely different experience and not one that i had wanted out of it um it, it's a very visually stunning movie that um you know it is good to look at but it is more about personal like change and and how we are different and yet the same and how we evolve as people based on our past experiences and the traumas that we go through uh and and it is also more focused on the central female characters and their interactions while in area x reflecting their experiences before they entered area x and this just isn't that and i don't even agree with that man but continue I I love this book series so much because I read it before I saw the movie that all of the things I loved were not in that movie. <laughs> like the, and it wasn't and listen I understand it would be really difficult to adapt this movie adapt the series into a movie you would have to do a, a TV series oh absolutely with yeah multiple with timelines. Context. Yeah, there's absolutely too much content. No, but uh, even like um, objectively, the movie is not good. Okay, so I haven't watched the movie. I've just watched a lot of video essays about it. So I think thematically, and so I'm obviously an expert on this. Um, I think thematically, the movie was going for something different. It's not like a one-to-one -one adaption, like um, Jurassic Park, for example, where there are certain things that a movie adds tonally and, and thematically to the book, but it's still mostly the same events. These are similar concepts and a few similarities in, a few similarities in plot, but mostly it's just doing an entirely different thing. Even in the book series, there's a lot of people turning into gross animal creatures. Um, and I asked Marie, uh, the most important question when you started this series is there a giant mutant bear in the book series and she said no which i was disappointed by but there are some other gross creatures and that's an aspect that's just almost totally missing from the movie sure yes i agree with what both of you said in the translation of the movie blah blah blah, blah. the movie as a like movie person let loves movies uh -huh. not a good movie though it, it, the pacing was really really bad the um it was not a focus on their past although that is i I mean, it was a character study more so than a, oh, uh, alien arrival or whatever it is that you want to do. Or like even it was like a pantomime at a philosophical film asking what does it mean to be me? 
Uh, but it was not well done, even remotely, and it was horribly paced, and the visuals were not that great. They were, like, good, but they were not like, oh, yeah, it's safe film. Absolutely not. And then the final encounter was, like, boring. Like, I thought... That it was I will super, agree with. Super boring and lame and not fun, and not even fun in, like, a... Like, for example, at the end of The Mist, when uh what's his face kills his son or like they all commit suicide except for him and he's like oh my god the rv just arrived you could have all been saved that's a great horrible ending something in that like field where you have like a really depressing ending but it's a really good depressing ending that is not the case for that movie that is the case for the book I didn't think it was a depressing ending in the movie though I thought yeah. the problem with it is is that it was a hopeful like it, it, it was a much more hopeful ending. The two of them embracing as two people changed as different things. I mean, listen, I didn't like it as an ending, especially because that's not what my book is doing. It's one of those things where I feel like I think of the Annihilation movie as like vaguely related, but not an actual adaptation. If that makes sense, it's, it's not an adaptation. It's just it's, an adoption. It, yeah, it's more like somebody watched them or read the books and was inspired by a small part of it and extrapolated it into their own uh series because for me the book series or their own movie is more about like unending trudge towards progress and change on a cosmic environmental level yeah uh and then that movie is more about change on an individual level yeah. and and how you come out as a different person but you are the same and different it's like somebody read the first book and just ended it there but also knew that the director had <gasps> cancer like i can <laughs> Well, well, okay, okay so, so the, the thing, thing is, and one of the things, things I'll talk about is this book series is weird because you get, okay, there's like the plot of the first book, and you're like, okay, what happens next? next? And then the next two books are like, psych, we're going to move that plot a little bit forward, but mostly talk about things that happened before that. And so I can understand from a certain point of view that the, the filmmakers might have looked at that and been like, we don't really want to do all this backstory on the Southern Reach. We're really more interested in this story. <laughs> What's funny, funny is, is I don't, don't know if you're just doing, doing hand gestures, gestures or if you suddenly got, got muted. muted. No, I, I was just doing Oh, just, just hand gestures. gestures. Yeah, you were, you were going to continue talking and I was just going to continue doing And that. then we just sat and looked at you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then you just sat and looked at me. And so I think we'll be making certain comparisons to the movie as we go through the book. But um, especially for me, the book was very much its own thing, maybe because I haven't watched the movie. As someone who has done both. <laughs> it is completely different. I think people who like the movie will probably like the book. But I think if you found the book first and then you go to the movie, you might not like it as much that way. Are you kidding me? You'll, you'll be disappointed. And listen, I'm, I'm not a one of those people where like an adaptation has to be completely faithful. Um and, and sometimes it is to get the spirit of the thing. But for me, this didn't get the spirit of the thing. It, it just, it got a different spirit that I didn't like as much. So yeah, that's, that's and, and I probably will not make a lot of comparisons to the movie. I will make no comparisons the to book the movie because it's just not even own. remotely the same. It, I'll, I'll tell you up until the point it starts being different. Number one. You mean why immediately? Did, why does it call the Area X the Shimmer? Like, why did you take a good name and make it the shimmer <laughs> gag me with a you don't rusty like fork okay to be fair they do describe it inwardly as a shiny thing when she's talking exactly. about the change in her yes the, the brightness she describes it as the brightness yeah, the shimmer and the brightness. brightness so it's one thing to be like we call it the shimmer anything that goes in if we don't get out or we can't blah 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 like there's that and then there's this brightness inside me that I didn't want to, I called it the brightness because I didn't want to examine what it might actually be happening inside me. Two different vibes. <laughs> one is Kamehameha and one is beautiful and bright. Oh. <laughs> I think that, you know, it's one of those things where like in movies, they don't like to say werewolf for whatever reason or zombie. Like Area X, I think to them sounded too generic in a like comic booky way. So they decided to change it. I don't, think either That's exactly why. That's exactly yeah i don't really think either is great i would have preferred something like southern reach like just that was what they called the area um but then also to be fair in this book they also just keep calling it the area after a while which right. is better forgotten post which is oh that is hella cool failure like, island yeah 
Yeah, it, I remember seeing that in the World of Warcraft maps. Another good change they made though, and you have to admit this, from book to movie, is that in the book, they all have their heads shaved, which is gross. And in the movie, they didn't do that. So that I think is something that- Not throughout the whole, first of all, not throughout the whole thing. And also second, shaved heads are way cooler because it shows a change in your physical status. Not everyone has a good head. Not everyone has a good head. It's sometimes- For us, it's a book. Well, that's why I'm saying. I, I cannot believe, William, that you thought that that was funny enough of a comment <laughs> to mention during this serious discussion about so much symbolism and evolution and how they think that you decided to talk about the whole fucking head. No, 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 no. Thematically, it's important that... No, it's not. I think the thing is that... I, to me, I, I, okay, so I haven't watched the movie, um, but to me, I don't really compare it to the, so maybe that's why I didn't compare the book to it as much. To me, they're just very much separate things. Um, so like to me, I, I under, Katie has said the movie is not good. I've heard from a lot of people it's good. Again, I don't really have an opinion outside of video essays I've watched about its meaning. So to me, it's kind of like, okay, I probably actually won't, I'll probably title this something like, how does the book compare to the movie? Two question marks, exclamation point. But I actually don't think we're gonna be making that many comparisons to the book as we go on. We're, uh, you mean to the movie? Yeah, no, we're not. If you like it, that's really cool. But as far as like extra, extraterrestrial dimensional horror slash like mutation stuff goes besides the bear scene in 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 and of itself being a horrific scene and like some other like kind of cool details they never patches together into one cohesive really cool story like it's just it, it's almost like somebody saw or drew some fan art of the book and were like you know what i want to put these together in a movie but then they just didn't want to carry over the intensity of the story. So the basic premise of this, uh, the first book, Annihilation, is there is this area called Area X. And uh, to the general public, it is a place that is the uh, that had a environmental catastrophe. And there is this area called the Southern Reach, this or this group, um, uh, an agency called the Southern Reach that is working on... Uh, containing the environmental hazard that happened in Area X. And, uh, but the rest of the world has stopped thinking about it. But unbeknownst to the rest of the world, uh, expeditions are still being sent into Area X. Nobody's really sure what happens. And our main character in this, who we are reading her journal that she has written on this expedition is the biologist. In Area X, you don't get the name, you get a function. Um, and we're seeing the expedition into this place through her eyes, through her uh, digestion. And it is, once she starts prepping for everything, it is a place that is separated from the rest of the world by a border that is impenetrable except for one spot. And inside, fucked up shit. Not really sure what happened. And that's the whole point of the Southern Reach. What happened? Why is Area X separated from everything else? And why, when we send people in, when they come back, are they fucked up? Or why do we send people in and they never come back? Or what is happening in Area X? And why we did do it happen? We, we do, do not, not know. And that's the basic premise of the first book. Oh, by the way, another kind of interesting liminal space that exists in our world. Do we have a Patreon? Does that exist? Does it change you on a monomolecular level? It, I believe it does, William. You should go subscribe and support us if you want to see more content like this. And we have a Discord. The Discord's a lot of fun. We got some cool people. And we have a book club where once a month you get to nominate a book that we may or may not read. And you also get to vote on whatever the nominations were. We pick three of them and then you get to vote on that. And we do another book club uh, live stream every month where we have picked the book and you get to read it with us. And then we talk about it. You've probably seen some of the videos. We do above that, above the book club tier, have the parasocial darling tier. What do we do once a month on live stream, Katie? We do editing and we do proofreading and we discuss pros and and how you can maybe potentially become a better writer and how we can become better writers when we discuss it with each other it is not us lecturing you it is more like an exploration to the world of narrative and like what works what doesn't work enjoy it with us and explore
I like the way I like to describe it is that these reviews, uh, the normal podcasts are a macro look at a book and those live streams are a micro look at the pros and what the author is doing. And actually, I would really like to do a section from the, the second book in this series there oh my God, I would love where to well. reality just starts like rupturing in the pros themselves and it's done really masterfully. And I think that would be really cool to look at. Uh, it's the part where uh, the director returns in the second book. Mm. That's what it should have been called, honestly, the, the director strikes back. Did you read it, Will? No, I listened to it. See, listening to it, I couldn't, I couldn't, I also listened to it at two times speed to make sure I made this deadline, so I don't remember a lot of prose, <laughs> even though that was like the best part of the book almost. I remember thinking like how nice his prose are. Like he's a really talented writer. Oh my you God. You get so much more of the meaning. One of the biggest things I noticed, because uh, I read the book and listened to it, because at some point it's like, I had to do both to meet this deadline. Um, and you digest so much more of what is being said and what the yeah, underlining course. stuff is when you read it than when you listen to it. There, There is a skimming that happens when you listen. Like you're, you're, you're getting the meaning, but you're kind of floating on top. Like getting the fat off of milk. You yes. Know? And, and so you're, you're getting like the super, like you're getting a portion, but there's all this stuff that you're missing when you're not physically. Re and I say this as someone who, audiobooks the majority of them and for most of the books we read it really does not matter it does not like, the, and the prose some, is not doing anything spectacular <laughs> no or in some the audiobook is actually very few but the audiobook is actually makes the book even better and in this case this is one of those books where it, it almost the best for me was listening to it and reading it at the same time oh yeah i could see that it was incredible i only started doing it in the last third of the last book but it was incredible because the audiobook narrators in this are truly fantastic and are bringing a lot of They're like so good there were certain lines that like especially the male narrator read from Saul's point oh, of view no. that that I didn't when I was reading the words I didn't automatically take them that way but it brought this whole extra layer to it and so if you want the ultimate reading experience for the Southern Reach trilogy I recommend getting the audiobooks and reading the actual books at the same time not, not sponsored, sponsored by, by Amazon, Amazon guys, guys. Not, Not sponsored, sponsored by, by Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, what differences what differences did you notice having read it originally and then having li read it now? Like, were there differences? So there was a lot more things that, because I had read it before, that rereading the first book, I realized were references to things that happened to, in the third book that you don't pick up the first time. Like, uh, she has a dream about her husband as a bird, and then he... He, he's an owl later. Um, she There's a lot of references to Leviathans in the first and the second book that kind of hit. Because uh, like one of the things in my first read, there are three images I could not get out of my head on my first read. Number one, the uh, psychologist, the mask of the psychologist from the 11th expedition that she finds in the reeds and him coming through the water in the reeds, that... Uh, and her going down uh, into the tunnel. The the Whitby, the Whitby event. Oh God! Book two, yes. The Whitby, Whitby event of book two, and then the biologist as the Leviathan in book three. Those things stuck out to me so hardcore uh, that all the references to Leviathans in the first and the second book I picked up more, and I realized that this book is so tightly like this man knew. I, I here's the thing: I don't know if Vandermeer knew what he was doing at the start of Annihilation. I don't know if he understood how he was going to expand this, but when he wrote the second book and the third book, that those were written with both of them in mind. A plan, yeah. With a plan, because they are beautifully interlinked. They are so gorgeously woven together. And the thing is, I have to think he knew because the the photo of Saul and Gloria in the that you see in the first one comes up again in the second one and comes up in the third like it, it just feels so tightly thought of and like it's not a despite the fact that this is a potentially world ending uh phenomenon that's happening it is so tightly the the scope of it is so tight on these characters this coast to this life and there's also, especially in book two and three, a slow mundanity, like a an everydayness, a routineness, a uh, living through things that I just like to have it mixed in with this sci-fi-ish 
horror unknown. Was which men- just, melancholy. It yes. really creates the flavor of that really sad, that particular flavor of like, for example, The Road. Isn't that what it's called? Yeah, Cormac Story. McCarthy. Yeah. It has that one very specific flavor of depressing uh, like existence sort of kind of thing. Um, I, Maria, uh, one of the things Maria was talking about is the interwovenness of it. There's this one part that she and I were discussing just a little bit of before we started recording where I was just like, oh my gosh. Um, in the second book where there's a uh, girls in this diner where our main character is sitting and they're repeating the same dialogue, but in a different context as the characters in the first book. And it's very almost like movie influence because I can almost see a movie doing that in the background. Um, but yeah, no, I, uh, were there any images for you, Will, that were really specific that lingered? The, uh, what was he called? The little doctor that Maria was just talking about? Whitby? Um, that one, uh, I still see the mural. Like, I, I can see it. It's yeah. weird. Um, when the director strikes back, that image of her in the rain um, with everything behind her, that one really stuck. Smiling. Oh. I know. That was an image. Even in my two times speed in the audiobook, I it still sat in me. I think those were the two that really stuck with me. Um, there was another one you mentioned that I that I really jived with but i can't remember what it is now but um yeah there were a couple that were like for some reason them on the not salt flats but the tide pools at the end of book Book two two. for some reason really sticks with me a lot of scenes in this book stick with me because he's a he again his prose are really good and then another difference for me between the first and the second read is the first read through the second book was overwhelmingly my favorite uh but on this one the third book really came as like a sleeper sensation for me because I I remember reading it but it didn't have as much of an impact and partially because the Whitby scene in book two the entire last third of book two is so fucking powerful and intense uh, that it kind of overshadows but on the the reread book three I think is for me much better and and it's partially because it's the only one where I had besides the creepy horror sensation I had fondness like there the all the scenes with Saul on the coast on my second read through I I cried at the end of the third book I literally reading Gloria's like listening to the narrator read Gloria's uh no letter the letter and her being like uh love Gloria the girl who jumped on the rocks and uh was a pain <laughs> like it was like and I had the reaction I had this time was so much more powerful. And I think it's because on the first read through, I enjoyed Saul and I was sad for him, but I had that coming into it and I knew how sad his ending was going to be. And the thing is, you know, from the beginning of the third book that Saul ain't going to have a good time. Like, <laughs> you know that Saul is fucked. Um, but I think because I'd experienced his sad, slow, emotional journey the first time that rereading it, 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 it's one of those cases where, you know, how a lot of times things that make you sad the first time don't make you as sad the second time. This is the reverse. It like, Mm -hmm. I think you need the context of the entire series once to be able to really feel it. It's like, um, yeah, Theoden's speech in Return of the King, no matter how many times you listen to it, it gets more powerful each time as they ride down on the works again i i think it's an excellent series i think I, again i i have some structural issues that i just don't think i think the book could be stronger without them it, it's um it's kind of like um uh knives out in the first knives out there's a moment where the whole movie recontextualizes itself as another type of movie um in terms of it gives you some information from the beginning of the movie that you're like oh shit this is now a different type of movie and it's really effective there in terms of the structure but in the second movie it does the same thing but you don't need to in in the first movie it recontextualizes what genre of film we're watching and who we're supposed to be rooting for whereas in the second movie it's just like Oh, that was what was happening this whole time. It, it's not as much of a recontextualization as it is just a reveal. Yeah, and honestly, the story could have just been told in that way and you wouldn't actually lose anything. And I kind of feel that a little bit about this book and that you could almost just have told the story sequentially and I don't know that you really get anything from doing them uh, non-linearly. We can talk about that more as we go because it has to do with a lot of the specifics. I do want to say just in summation... Into that, the thing is, is I think that the background information and the heading back makes this, it does, has two effects that I think are really important for the uh, tone of the whole piece. 
which is the one, the loneliness and the sadness of the loss. It's because the loss has already happened, but by going back in time, already knowing that and then seeing what happens, it's almost like this, like, you know, it's like history repeating itself, which is really depressing. And it makes you feel like you're in a cyclical nature, which you can never escape, which is also part of like the whole thing that's happening. You can't escape Area X and how it's expanding. So I think it replicates that feeling uh, in and of it doing that structurally, but also simultaneously, I think it, uh, without it, you wouldn't feel as like you went through it i actually do understand what you're talking about the the especially in the last book the two perspectives we get the director and saul do have a real loneliness is almost a good word for it uh, of like a melancholy because we know where yeah. this is gonna end there is also a futility when yeah, you find right. out yeah when you find out how it all actually started how poor saul got fucked because one guy drilled a hole into a goddamn lens and now that's what started that that moment started everything and the, the futility of the whole endeavor and the uh, how you can't stop it it makes it makes it so much worse and it's something where if you'd found out at the beginning Everything else that came after wouldn't have meant as much. The first book wouldn't have been as cool. The I think the second book would have... The second book has an air of mystery and discovery to it. And I don't think you could have told it sequentially. At least for me, for what I like and what I get out of it. I think you could do it the way Will wants to. But I think it would take some of what it made it work for me. But that's what like... That's like the idea behind like the lore, right? The lore behind something is sometimes even cooler to know it at, once the story has finished because it gives it so much more depth and I feel like this mimics like it's because it is creating an artificial reveal by giving you the end result and then going back and giving it to you but it has a different reveal to it you know what I mean mm -hmm. like kind of like the others even though it's like an ancient movie at this point you know like there's like a weird magicalness to it because time doesn't matter we're doing the thing again where we talk for a really yeah. long time so i'm gonna um i have more arguments to make about it but i'm gonna wait till the ending because i, I yeah. think they do have to do All with right. the ending um so maria let's go ahead and jump into the plot then yes i'm gonna try to go through really quickly because there's three books and we normally spend a ton of time the first book annihilation really is just an uh the biologist who is this woman, I, I don't like that in the movie they give them names. I think having the function of them as their identity in Area X is a really profound thing and makes such a difference, especially as the books go on and they expand. Like finding out that the psych psychologist is also the director and is also Gloria. Like, oh, it's her experience uh, coming in with her uh, expedition discovering the uh, tower, which is this tunnel going, or a tower, but one that goes underground, uh, kind of. It's a tunnel. Infinity. They just think of it it's as a tower. tower. <laughs> it's a tower. In my head, it's a tower. Like, it's an underground tower, but it's also a tunnel. Like, <laughs> is that just like a meaningless argument? Or is it because of the first original lighthouse and like the falling location? Realistically speaking, it's a tunnel. And actually, it's not even a tunnel. It's really more like someone's guts. But I really like the symbolism and the image that you get from Tower. Because you're like, oh, it is. You, you do think of it in your head as an upside down tower that's going down and getting creepier and weirder as you go down the tower. And there's a lot of connections with the word that I think are good. But like, in terms of it is a tunnel. What it is, <laughs> it's it not is. A, a tower goes up. It's it's a tunnel. It's a version of the lighthouse. And in it's almost as if it was supposed to happen at the lighthouse. It was supposed to just be the inversion of the lighthouse. But because Saul is a fucking baby boy, he, he did a run because he didn't want it to be at his lighthouse and his place that was his. So he went as far as he could manage to get away from it. So it's it, the intention I got is that it was supposed to be the inverse of the lighthouse, but he just, he fucking ran off <laughs> and that's what happened. But anyway, uh, and there's a bit of uh, dynamics between the characters initially, because there's other, it's all women on this expedition. You learn from the biologist that her husband had been on the, she's the 12th expedition and her husband had been on the 11th expedition 
Uh, and there had been some tension between her and him, like the relationship hadn't been doing well. It was one of those cases of two people who are fundamentally very different and are very enchanted by each other in the beginning, but slowly, like at a certain point, the husband's like, why are you so distant? And she's like, this is just who I am. I'm sorry, I'm who you married. But anyway, um, and her husband had ended up coming back from that expedition, but not in the way he was supposed to. Or like he didn't come through the southern reach, uh, which is the organization that sent him on the mission. He just appeared at their house. And so she knows something is up. But her motivations for going into Area X are not entirely to do with her husband, but more to do with there is something that he has seen. And she, the biologist as a person is fascinating because she is more empathetic and focused on natural landscapes and, and not just natural landscapes, but nature coming into human areas and life happening. And this idea that life is just going to exist, that if you just leave it alone in a pool, in a parking lot, life is going to happen. And she's fed fascinated by these transitional places where things are where they shouldn't necessarily be based on human thought. Um, and so she spends a lot of times on her like biologist jobs, just like vibing out. She's also a bad biologist because she forgets why she's there and she just focuses on the stuff that she wants to. And that's why she wants to go into area X because he described it as this pristine, like everybody described it as this pristine landscape and she wants to see it. And when she's in there, she butts heads with some of the other characters, particularly there's this psychologist who uses hypnosis on everyone. And she's kind of like, mm, I don't like you. We need to talk head. about the hypnosis for a moment. Hypnosis does not work the way it does in the book. In the book, it's, it's like- it's why Magical realism. It, it, again, it's just, it's just, it's a, it. That's where the fantasy element of this comes from. Yes, 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 but the, the thing is, is, the rest of it is so grounded. It's so, so this is a normal world with a weird thing stuck in the middle. That, that then to have another weird thing, thing, thing that's not connected to it be it was like a little bit off for me. I would have liked if there had some like mumbo jumbo about like oh it's connected to the sm the shimmer the area X or like this kind of conditioning only works in area X and we don't know why. I really liked it. It's because it made you feel like there are even more unexplained things in this version of our world and that's why this uh the shimmer can even exist in the first place in this version of our world it's because it's not our world like it's a, it's a detachment from like our normal mundanity which i think makes it even more interesting it's because it, it's like a world that's ours but not ours which is again just like the thing itself so i think it mimics itself like it reflects its own uh themes just fine in doing that does that make sense Yes, and I, for my reading, I'm much more on where Katie is, but I do understand for some people why, because it, it is not hypno hypnosis. It's, it's uh, magic with more steps, which I understand why for him as a viewer, having the Area X plus having magic with more steps that only only exists in the form of the hypnosis would bug him. But for me, it, it's just a part of the world that I very quickly just accepted. And I also yeah. like what it does for characters as a form of the characters that like it are super into having control and like how the things that people have gone to relate how they interact with the hypnosis, I find very valuable to the story, despite the fact that the mecha mechanism of it is like, you know, like, it's I, I'll agree. Yeah, yeah it, it adds a lot, lot in terms of the sense, sense that like also the unsettling of not only are they going into a weird place, but they don't quite know who sent them or why and what control they have over the group. Um, because there are creepy moments that we'll talk about in a moment where um, the biologist like realizes the others are being hypnotized and doesn't and nobody knew it up until that point. Um, and again, by the end of like the first book, I was like, all right, I'm on board now with it. Like, whatever. I've accepted it. And in the second book, it does a lot of creepy stuff. So I would have just liked to have been explained like a little, like just a fig leaf. You know what I mean? Like just a, a sprig of a fig leaf. Fair enough. I think he could have explained it in a way in universe to make it connect with the weirder stuff that was happening. Like, I'm sure he could have been like, it only works within this area of the country. Yeah, so the biologist uh, is kind of immediately a bit at odds with the rest of the group, or there's tension in the group. Because the thing is, again, the biologist, I don't know if Maria mentioned this, is super, not antisocial. Ex she's she's antisocial. She likes being on her own. She doesn't like being she's around Spock. other people. No, because even Spock connects with people more than she does. She like She comes off as a sociopath <laughs> because she like doesn't connect with people and she kind of thinks in a very kind of like logical morality. But I, I think that's a little bit of a disservice to her. I think she just more has a lot of trouble um, 
connecting with people and she empathizes a lot with environments. It's really fascinating because she does have, like Will said, a much easier time associating with landscapes. And almost immediately, the other people in her group notice how, like, thrilled she is with Area X and, like, all the things to observe. And not at this point in the beginning, but there's going to be a point where a character turns to her and goes, you prefer it here, Mm -hmm. don't you? And You really do. Yeah, and it's just a profound moment because you're like, oh yeah, no, she is, she's a pagan shit. She, she is. This is her element. That is a harmful stereotype, harmful and disgusting. They, they start and they find the the tower, which half of them call a tunnel. The biologist is like, no, this is a tower. They kind of start going down. As they go down, she notices that on the wall, or they all notice that on the walls are words, but the words are kind of glowing and they're made of these like little fungus thingies and they have these little star-like creatures floating around in it but it's bright and they're like holy crap and she leans in to take a look at it and get a sample and she accidentally breathes in a bit of like bright dust and she's like mm, should have wore masks that was very dumb and she's like why was i so dumb for a second time I'm <laughs> biologist. Uh, but they go back up and the, the team's a little bit split about do they go to the lighthouse which the southern reach tells everyone basically go to the lighthouse and they don't tell them that this tower is here um and uh so half of them are like let's continue like surveying and get the group and some of them are like let's go back to the tower so they end up deciding to go back to the tower the next morning one of their party is missing and the psychologist is kind of beat up uh the psychologist i should say is the person who is semi in charge of the group she's the one who led them through the uh opening the door in the border uh, and hypnotized them and they all know that hypnosis is a thing. They just think it's something that is used to get them to the border or to help them cope with really difficult things. Uh, once the biologist has ingested this piece of powder, though, she realizes she can now tell when the psychologist is hypnotizing them or not. Um, and she notices the others like freeze up and she realizes, oh, my God, she has been doing this this whole time. Is the reason do you think that the hypnosis doesn't work anymore? It's because obviously she has the brightness in her or whatever Mm -hmm. and that whole concept of the idea of communication how the words you expect them to mean don't actually mean what they do mean unless you have the pre supposition of what they're supposed to mean so like the the words that the psychologists are using no longer actually have meaning in the normal sense yes absolutely They're, they're completely disconnected from what they were actually supposed to mean at this point. We should also state that when she goes down into the tower, and basically we're not going to mention it every time, but everything in this book is so creepy and atmospheric and tense. I wasn't scared because I just don't think pros can scare me, but like it's it's really well done. It is um, off-putting and creep. creep. Mm-hmm. And this book isn't even the creepiest of the three. No, absolutely not. Like, funnily enough, I would say the second book's the creepiest. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree. (laughs) Because of one terrible scene, but it's fine. No, there's a lot in that book. It's funny because I read a horror book. Well, I'll talk about this later when we're talking about the second book. But it's really well done. The next morning after they lay there, like, we're going to go back down. But one of their party, the anthropologist missing, the psychologist is like, she decided to go back. She headed back to the border. And they're like, "Mm, we don't know if we believe you. And so they go back to the tower. And uh, as they go down, the psychologist is like, oh, wait up here. You two go down. Where we? And then the biologist is like, we should wear masks. Even though <laughs> it's too late for me. Um, but as they go down, they realize that the light, the words on the wall are getting brighter. And there's a sense that it's fresher. Um, and as they go down, they start to hear something below them. And they realize, oh, my God, are these being written as we're following? Also, the words on the wall are really intense. Let me grab my book because it's like a sermon. And Where lies the strangling fruit? fruit. The rotting uh, from thing. From the hand of the sinner. I thought it was real Bible verses, but no, it's just uh, uh, um, no. in the style of, yeah. It, yeah, so it feels like Bible verses, and it's really, like, creepy and atmospheric. Again, Vandermeer, excellent work. But question. anyway, yes? Question real quick. The words on the wall... They, like, it's described as being living tissue. Do you think it's just, like, do you think it's plant material, or do you think it's literally gore? Just, like, so growing So, the stuff? walls themselves are living. Yeah, is, is so alive. are the words but, themselves. 
but they are plant tissue specifically like that a fungus point. yes mm -hmm. so they, they, but they are on this living tissue and and so spoiler the tunnel tower is <laughs> actually made of flesh <laughs> surprise anyway uh, and she this is the first time the biologist notices that because she realizes the walls are breathing and she's like that's creepy and because the psychologist specifically before sending her in the surveyor down into the tunnel was like and you will not see the uh the wall. tower the walls at anything other than stone and at first she's like that's a weird thing to <laughs> it's so creepy and then she goes down and she goes okay that makes sense but as they head down um they come upon the body of the anthropologist which is the person that the psychologist said went back up to the um border to go back uh through and they're like, oh shit, she's dead. And she she has a sample of something. And the biologist is like, whatever is writing those words, fucking got her. Like, she out. It literally describes it as if she was ripped open like this. Yeah, it's it's not good. Fish up. Um, but anyway, so she takes the the sample from whatever she took, and they they're gonna go down a little bit more. But then they also once they see this, they're like, okay, no, we can't. We have to go up and see what the heck happened with the psychologist. But then they get up and the psychologist isn't there anymore. And some stuff happens between her and the surveyor, but I'm going to kind of blow through that. She ends up deciding to go to the lighthouse because she thinks that's where the psychologist went. Um, and so she's trekking through. And uh, what we don't discover at this point, but it gets told to us later, is the brightness is beginning to affect her, where despite being tired, she gets through the distance. It's like several miles really quickly and she doesn't tell you this in the initial going through of the plot um and partially because she is trying really hard to be a reliable unbiased narrator and uh, she tells you she doesn't tell you about her husband initially i don't know if we mentioned but diegetically this is first person where she's supposed to write a log of everything that's happened to her one of the things about it that's interesting is that like I usually don't like first person as we've talked about. It's a it's a fine method of delivering your story, but I think no, it tends to make great. Yeah, I think it tends to make authors a lazy and characters sit around and think about things, but here it is yeah. so well so done because there there's a sense that you really get into the mind of the biologist. And one of the things is that you really get a sense that she, as much as she couldn't connect with her husband, there is a longing to connect with him and yeah. and a a melancholy of him being dead and there's a complication there but part of that comes through like what she does and doesn't write about him and if this was more of a um, non-diegetic first person i don't think it would work as well but you get the sense that it she's wouldn't. holding back a little bit especially early on because as the story goes on you or the, the first book goes on she starts like she starts letting in more details about the two oh, of them yeah. together that i think and it's telling a you about their life yeah, and, and different moments together. And um, oh, another thing I should mention, because I just a lot of the dialogue in this book is weird and almost like overly formal or like sudden almost. Um, and the thing about it is it doesn't break the immersion of the world because the biologist herself is such a weird person. And also you're in such a sort of weird dreamlike state that you kind of accept it as like, okay, this is adding to it. One of the things um, in one of our critique streams, uh, join our Patreon and support independent journalism that me and Katie talked about in the first one we did is that the first chapter of this book we were reading, The Savior Sister, um, was so bad that it just felt more like a dream. Like it was kind of everybody, nobody was quite talking to each other correctly the dialogue was yeah. a little bit off and that was yeah. a mistake on the part of the author whereas in this way it actually helps the disjointedness of how they talk um especially yeah. in contrast to the second and third books where you do have like really character voices that feel different and more yep. real and have a greater vermicitude she she's going down to the and it, the reason i will just mention the husband is because i i was beginning to say that she doesn't tell you that her husband had been part of the first expedition for like the first third of like, it takes her a minute before she's like, by the way, my husband was part of the previous expedition. I didn't tell you that because I didn't want you to think I was influenced <laughs> by it. Um, <laughs> and, and that's what happens with her suddenly finding her body very strong. She's running like a near constant low grade fever and she doesn't tell you about it as it's happening. She tells you about it towards the end. Um, but she is going through a change and you get little bits like she talks about the brightness inside her that feels like uh, something is happening. Uh, we should also uh, explain about the husband very quickly that what happened is he was part of the previous mission 
And when people come back from the area, or actually this had only happened this, I got the impression in the first book this had happened multiple times, but really it had only happened this time to the 11th, the 11th team, um, is that he had, without them knowing, gotten all of the people from that expedition showed up back at their own homes and they couldn't explain how they got there. They are very passive and docile almost. Um, and they didn't really, you didn't really see that life in them that a normal person would have. And then they died of cancer like a year later. Like very quickly, real uh, rapid cancer. Um, uh, but yeah, so she's heading towards the lighthouse. Uh, as she gets there, she can see that there's been signs of a struggle. There's blood, there's evidence of a fight. Not recent, not recent by any stretch of the imagination, but everything is in ruin. Overturned tables that look like they were used to like defend. There are initials and words scratched into the walls of the lighthouse as she gets to the top because again she's looking for the psychologist and trying to see what the heck happened so she's very cautious and as she gets to the top uh she finds the uh lens but also she finds a trap door and in it is a pile of the same notebooks that she has been writing her journal in and there is just more than could possibly be accounted for for 11 other uh expeditions expeditions like just mountains and she kind of starts going down and she positions the room upstairs so that if the psychologist comes up on her she'd be able to get it but she finds uh she's reading through a bunch of them she finds uh something from like the last uh uh she finds a bunch and she's just reading through them and eventually she finds her husband she doesn't want to read it immediately so she doesn't she just she just takes it and as she lo is looking out on the beach once she comes out from the space she sees a foot sticking out from this one bush and she realizes as she goes down that it's a psychologist and the psychologist is dying and as she comes up and she's like hey it's me the psychologist wakes up and starts screaming annihilation 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 and at first you're like i don't know why she's doing that that's a weird thing to say in this moment but it adds to the crypt crip factor for me i was like oh ding you know like it's the title drop and i initially thought oh it's the hypnosis and she wants her to stop session. Oh, you're right. That is the keyword for that. I forgot. That is, that is the keyword, but I didn't realize the first time I read it that that's what oh, was happening. But anyway, and she ends up having a conversation with the psychologist and we get a couple things out of this. Number one, the psychologist knew more than she let on. Who and knows? And answers very little of the biologist's questions in any meaningful way. Uh, my girl, Gloria. <laughs> the end. I love her. Um, but uh, as she ends up dying, the biologist ends up touching her and realizes her one shoulder and arm are squishy. No, 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 it's squishy. Spongy. Yeah, poor, like there's a- I hate mm -hmm. that, I hate that description. It, yeah, it, it's, it's That's terrible. Why it stuck with me. I hate that texture. And she's, she's uh, kind of, she's also bleeding out her legs injured. What you end up discovering is that uh, she, as she dies, she had a cut. Um, and oh no, she so her leg was injured, but when she takes off the her clothing, her arm is just moss. It is just spongy green stuff. Uh, yeah, it's not great. Uh, and she, she and it's because it's the fucking biologist who just taking samples of everything. She takes a sample of the of the. Somebody of the jokes about it in the third one that they're like, yeah, if I met her, she wouldn't like me very much, and she would take a sample from me probably. Bird <laughs> says that. Yeah, yeah. It's literally. Anyway, um, and uh, so she ends up going through the uh, psychologist things and she finds a couple of things. She finds the psychologist journal, which is literally just the writing on the walls of the tower and nothing else. She finds a piece of paper with the hypnotic commands written on it, including that annihilation is suicide uh, upon uh, your telling whoever is here is you to commit suicide. Um, and she finds a letter that she doesn't understand it makes zero sense to her. And this is why I mm -hmm. think this man knew what he was doing because it just, it it's, got like he, um, it reads like he wrote a short story at some point and was like, wow, I love this. And then built a world around that short story. And part of that short story is in the first version, yep. in, uh, in the first book. And, um, or, or in third. Uh, what, what I liked about it is that the Easter, Easter eggs are there, but it's not something where it hurts the functioning of the scene. 
So, so in the first, first you don't figure out till the very, literally the last chapter who this letter with S on it is to, but, but it doesn't hurt the mystery in this book. You're not like, okay, okay what was that thread? Why did it not go anywhere? It's just like, oh, that was cool. So uh, she has this whole thing with the psychologist. She, she takes her, the stuff that she had, and she goes to read her husband's journal now at this point, and she gets to see what happened, and she realized his entire journal is written to her as if he's addressing it to her and his nickname for her was ghost bird because she's kind of like a ghost in his life, but like always watching. Um, and, uh, after reading his journal, uh, where she discovers that a bunch of them went into the tower, uh, and then, uh, she basically comes to terms with the fact that whatever came back to her was not actually her husband, but was, a copy of and she realizes i have to go into the tunnel and or the tower and i have to deal with whatever's at the bottom of it and she goes in and it is creeptastic but she goes and she sees this thing and immediately like as she goes down and i down think this and is and actually the second time she sees it no she didn't see the crawler the first time what did you picture when you pictured uh saul in its form like what what kind of literally what illustration came in your mind so initially how it's initially described is just kind of, it was kind of like this circle with a bunch of rings that was orange with a mass in it that yeah. kept shifting and changing yeah. but like with these like halos of different almost almost like you know those uh balls that have the rings that go around like this yeah like a an old school angel from like the bible where it's like nine wings and two eyes and there's a yeah, bunch of things going on i actually didn't i imagined him kind of like the shambling creature from alex vance the vr um property where I, that's how I pictured him. I know that's not how he looks, but in my head, he was always just like a shambling guy who has like big pustules, kind of Last of Us-esque. Interesting. It's because I literally pictured Howl's Moving Castle stars. Oh, wow. Actually, I was wondering if you were going to say that. That's why no. I was so curious if you were so, because sometimes, Maria, I, you and I are so alike. We, we, have we, would have to, we would have to go back to how I read it the first time, because unfortunately, by the time I read it this time, I... Have I knew you were, he gets he gets he gets described in the first book and he also gets described later so I had an idea of what uh and, and, and so he was supposed to look like exactly I pictured literally the fallen stars of Howl's Moving Castle fair that's really because again I I saw that like the, like a green haloed with like a bunch of rings but for me the rings yeah, were kind of like, like yeah mine were like yeah you, know. you yours were like that for me it was more like the the rings were like bands Mechanical. of metal like going but also like halo-ish and then inside was this amorphous thing that kept shifting because what she sees is it's just shifting it's it's fierce it's different things as it's shifting and then uh, it turns and looks at her at a certain point and it annihilates her she it, oh, it's more pain the title Oh, there's the title drop. Um, but it's m the most pain she's ever been in. And it's like she's being like just from the inside, the brightness in her is reacting to that. And it's this huge amount of pain. And then it turns away from her and she's left kind of like crumpled and broken. And she starts running past it. Uh, like, because even though she's crumpled and broken, she knew, knows she needs to get away from whatever that thing was. She's um, a really strong survival instinct. She's super strong. So she just keeps running and she knows she's running in the wrong direction because where is she going? She's going deeper into wherever this is heading. It's not like the way out is up there, but she's like, what am I going to get to? So she keeps running and she ends up coming to a point where there's this giant bright white light ahead of her. And she instinctually knows that if she goes there, it is something different that it is this point that she can't come back from and she doesn't want to do that. So she ends up deciding to turn around and she's like, I'm just going to have to leap past the crawler this time. Question. Didn't she picture it as a door with a light? Yes. The, this is really thing creepy. Is that not supposed to mimic the door with the light in the science division? Oh. See, for me, it, it mimicked the doorway into the, that shimmering light doorway into the, into area X Similarly, oh. the light at the end of that uh, tide pool. The way I like, because so notice I didn't have book two or three in my brain, mm -hmm. but when I remember very specifically, I could be wrong, but I remember very specifically the description being like a metal door with a red light going on and off slowly. And uh, it was so weirdly mundane in comparison to everything else she had been experiencing. And I was like, 
Is this going to be like a switcheroo where the lab has entrance to it at the end of this? And I don't remember it being that mundane. I do remember it being a door with like lights, but I don't remember it. I don't know. I just remember I, it actively making me think, again, like, could be wrong, but I remember it actively making me think, is there a lab connected to this? Is this, like, going to be, like, really left field when I read the next book and not even remotely like the movie? Like, I, I wasn't really sure what to expect from there, but yeah. I, I, so I, it was, like, a weird... I really thought that the scientists were going to have a connection to it. Uh, or, like, so, literally a doorway to it. Continue. They sort of do, but not through that doorway. It's Whitby and that goddamn plant. Yeah, I know. Um, anyway, uh, and so she ends up running back. And as she's running past the crawler this time, because she's trying to, like, get past it without it noticing and it, you know, annihilating her again. Uh, but she knows whatever has happened with that, like, it has done something to her. But as she's going past it this time, she looks... And all the shifting forms in the center of the crawler coalesce into the face of a man with a beard and a strong jaw and one side of his, like, his one eye is a little sleepy. And she realizes that when she'd been in the White House, she saw a picture. And in the picture uh, was two men standing next to each other and then a young girl with a hood playing on some rocks. And she immediately assumed that the one there, there was a red circle drawn around the one guy's face that that was the lighthouse keeper because he just looked like a lighthouse keeper and that the other person must have been his attendant and she sees in the face of the crawler the lighthouse keeper it is his face and she knows that that is his true face all the other things she'd been seeing beforehand were uh the hallucinations meant to scare her because the same thing happens as something like that happens with another character later and it is literally the crawler uh taking things from your own life to scare you with but that is what why did his face that? i don't know <laughs> This book requires a level of study, these three books. Like, I feel like you could study this and write a paper. Oh, are about... you kidding me? Absolutely. Yeah. And, Did... and that's one of those things that I'd have to sit down and really look at. I don't think we mentioned it, but also when she was studying the, the samples earlier, she found that, like, the DNA of, like, the pig she had killed and, like, the other weird crawler creature she'd found were human. And so, like, a thousand percent human. And so you, this is something where, like, the zone like is turning people into something else oh, yeah we didn't mention the dolphin the dolphin or the moaning creature in the reeds two things that happen and the reason i have to say this is because it is fundamental to some of the stuff that's going to happen later but that also because it comes up a million fucking times <laughs> i know but it's also because it's so creepy the first time that so she's she's there's this area in area x is a transitional space it's got uh scrublands it's got swamp it's got uh, ocean is a transitional area and there's dolphins coming up through the river that she's at and as the one passes her it looks at her and it has a human ass eye and she's like why did it have that's not a dolphin eye that's a human eye i know because i am a biologist like very and it's so creepy because you're like why is and then there's also a point where she goes into an abandoned village and in the houses our tree, our bushes in the shapes of humans. And the thing is, she confuses you at first because she doesn't describe them that way. She describes them as eruption. I did not catch on to that even remotely in the in the audiobook. But she yeah. describes them as giant eruptions of greenery. But if you pay attention to how she's describing them, there are three distinct eruptions on a couch mm -hmm. towards the TV. Oh, yeah. yeah. She also yeah. says they're human looking. <laughs> She's yeah. like, oh, that's weird. They look kind of like people. Yeah, but she waits a second. First, she's describing it because she does this thing where she describes it very scientifically and technically to you for a second. And then all of a sudden, she's like, they're kind of human shaped. And you're like, oh, buddy, that, those give away. You should have started with that. I was definitely painting during that scene because I remember pausing and being like, I didn't understand that. But I tried to rewind on my AirPods. But I don't know the right way to rewind. So I actually went back a chapter, and I was like, fuck! And I went back to my phone and just went back to the place I was at. I was like, fuck it, whatever. I missed yeah. it. The oh thing about God. this book is that but we yeah, talked about it earlier, but there are so many images that stick with you in this book that are just, like, emblazoned into your mind. Almost as if someone had been writing weird verses in little, little, like, starfish plants on a wall. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of which is also there's this moaning creature, and every night, every night, 
there is this guttural, agonized moaning that comes from a creature in the reeds. And there's a point where she, like, she's going through the reeds and she realizes it's later than, uh, and it's her heading back to the, the uh, tower from the lighthouse. And she realizes that she's in the reed place and it's getting to be nighttime where she hears the moaning. And as she's, like, trying to get through, she stumbles upon pieces of, like, skin as if it's a creature molted and the one is just this agonized face a human face and it's the face of the psychologist from the 11th expedition that went with her husband and you're like holy shit the creature in the reeds is the psychologist from the 11th and that moment that because like you see the dolphin with the human eye and you're like that's weird but when you have the moment of realizing that whatever that giant creature in the reeds is uh, and also because she hasn't had a chance at this point, she hasn't had a chance to test uh, her samples yet. So we don't have verification that that boar she killed was a human yet. Like you have the suspicion of it, but it hasn't been verified. And this is that moment where she sees and it's a face. But you also know that whatever is in the reeds is this big bulking thing. So you're just thinking of this a human. Uh, it's, it's one of the places, places where I usually spoil myself for books and movies and it never affects my enjoyment and i didn't specifically do that in this case but i had been aware of what's going on in the movie and it's one of the places i kind of would have preferred to have had the whole thing unravel in the book because when i saw the dolphin with the eye i'm like oh yeah that's a merged human person like whereas i feel like it would have been creepier if i hadn't quite understood what was going on i want you to know that when i pictured the scene again i was painting but Simultaneously throughout the entire process, majority of the time throughout all of three of these books, I was high. And so, so great. I, I, I want you to know I pictured, imagine no face from Spirited Away, mm -hmm. but white and with a clay face. And that's what I pictured this creature as. Yeah. It's not, it's not great. It's creepy. But uh, anyway, uh, the end of the book is basically after she's gone in, she's come out from the crawler like, and come back out. She basically goes, I'm going to stop writing in my journal. I have to deal with the brightness. She realizes that if she makes herself hurt, it holds the brightness back. That in trying to heal her from what has hurt her, it is not changing her. It is just healing her. And she's like, I'm going to just live. Goodbye, all. I'm, I'm not, not going, going home. home. Is, is like the, the last, last is like the last line, which, which leads into the second book really well. But I do want to talk about this book a little bit. I mentioned earlier that I would have. So this is novella length it, of the three books. It is the shortest. I think it's six hours instead of like 10 or 11. It was perfectly paid. So yes and no, in that I felt at times like it. I fell out of the world a little bit because it kind of felt like we were sprinting towards the end. Um, a little bit more like tension between the crew, I think, could have helped fill it out. But I think part of it is that that wouldn't necessarily have uh, said what the author wanted. Like the author wanted to say something and like, it, it, you know, uh, tension between the surveyor and the whoever. And then there's some backfighting and then like, I don't know, a creature problem comes up and then, you know, that kind of stuff like that almost would have been busy work um, away from the important moments um, like the, the kind of thing that a movie would add which it does actually funnily enough to kind of not pad the plot but add some of that uh, mainstreamness to it but I do feel like it things happened a little too fast which is funny because I feel like the second book would have been better as a novella than as the longer book it was I fully disagree on both counts which is fascinating continue Maria um so I I'm in the position where uh, for the first book, I, I, and Will and I briefly, like right before we started the recording, uh, I had said to him, he had mentioned that, and I really don't think that the first book could have worked because the only way to make it longer without changing, because Will's right. If you add the busy work, if you add the, um, like more dynamic power struggle, other characters are around, but now it takes away from what the story is actually about, which is following the psychologist through her, accepting that, like, yeah, no, she's fine being in an evolving ecosystem and, like, all the, the horror stuff. And it would make it more like what the movie is because that's literally what the movie does. The movie's like, we're going to make the f other female characters more significant. The psychologist is going to be around longer. She's going to go into the tower with the The other characters have thematic reasons of, like, I want to merge into something or I don't want to merge into something. They all have a past trauma that influences how they interact 
with Area X. Um, and uh, it, but it's a fundamentally different film, and it's not the it's not what I'm here for at all. And so I I like the length of it. In, I, I, I I would say the only thing that for me as a reader. I sometimes like the the day by day, like just categorizing, cataloging things. And I think if you made it longer, you could have just added more of her just exploring, cataloging, and going through daily things. But I think for most people, that would absolutely destroy the pace and plot. You know what? I take it back. I think the problem with it is that that was the setup. And I think if you had less of a, oh, there's indecision among the group and there's going to be a power struggle and one of them is secretly hypnotizing the others. If you took away that premise, I wouldn't have then wanted the more of the... But, of that. Yeah, I feel like it signaled one thing and then was another thing, almost. And and for me, I think you still need to have that someone is hypnotizing someone, but I think you could have done that without having the power dynamic struggles uh, issues. But also, she has to kill the surveyor at a certain point in the first book. Right? Which is sad, because I liked the yeah. surveyor. Um, and the second book, I, I can see how someone would prefer if it was shortened, but it, it, for me, it does that thing. It's in that zone I like of the procedural, the mundane, and the building. Because the, the second book, that's the whole I'm gonna, point of the second book is that is. there's the banal with the non banal, control oh. versus John. And the and slow buildup of the tension and the creep yeah, factor, that's and the you know. Point. You know more than he does. The one's supposed to make you feel uncanny valley. The first one is not supposed to make you feel that. It's supposed to make you feel alone in a very large ocean that's probably much deeper than you'd like to imagine. And there's a second, Leviathan over there. Yes. That you can and, see. Uh, and then there's the, there's the second one, which is more like X-Files. And then the third one, which is more like something... I actually don't disagree with any of that. I just think it could have been done shorter. I think the first half of the second book goes on too long. Um, but let's like let's say what the premise is, and then I'll say what my problems with it are. So the second book, it takes place in the Southern Reach facility. It is... Uh... No, I was just going to say, what's great is that the last line of the first book is, I'm not going home. And then I started the second book literally the next minute, and it starts with... The psych, the biologist, the the surveyor, and whoever already home, and you're like, oh shit, these are the clones. That's such oh, a cool yeah. like moment. This book is told third person, but from the point of view of this guy named John Rodriguez, who goes by Control, and he is taking over for the director of the Southern Reach. What you find out very quickly is that the psychologist of the mission that the biologist was on was actually the director of the Southern Reach. And I knew that the whole time. Oh my god. Well, yes, because you watched the fucking. Movie. <laughs> I don't remember that part of the movie at all? Oh. Actually, oh. Uh, I don't even barely remember the movie, at which might influence a second rewatch's opinion of whether or not it's good or not. Of course she was something more than just a psychologist. But she was the director and this guy, John Rodriguez, is coming in to replace her um, and he decides to go by the name Control. And this is his experience coming in and his job is to come in and fix the Southern Breach. It is not working well. It is stuck in a bunch of old protocol that isn't doing its job properly. He's here to bring fresh eyes to this thing and he knows that there's something weird and it might be aliens even though nobody at the southern reach or central we'll say the a word will say the a word you get a lot about control as a person in this book as well as his experience at the southern reach for instance his mother and grandfather were in espionage and uh like spy stuff <laughs> Like they both were, were and, and like as handlers slash in charge of like not a lot of field missions for these guys. They're they're above that. They they work in the organization. And so he from a young age wanted to get into this. And there's a sense from the beginning that his mom got him this job and he has messed things up enough that this is his last chance if he wants to stay in this line of work. Um, and he feels confident and he he thinks of himself as competent in this particular one function, which is coming in, fixing places, and then moving on to the next job. Uh, and But the Southern Reach isn't like that. It is complicated and messy. And you get his day-to-day -day life coming in. I'm talking cleaning out offices because... Uh, Cynthia, the director's office, is a goddamn mess. Him meeting the assistant director, him meeting the science department. You get him touring different facilities. And you get his cat, Churi. El Chorizo. And the thing that works about this is there is, like in the best horror movies, where there is a sense of just 
impending doom, but also like a futility because no matter how good he is at his job, everything is inscrutable. The The people who put him into control, into this situation, like he is above his or above his pay grade. Um, this what's going on with the Southern Reach can't or with the the zone can't quite be ever be figured out. And so you have this character who just is slowly almost a little pathetic in that everything is outside of his control, um, which is ironic because his nickname is control. It's a pun that like, and I usually like puns, but that's a bit much. I am fine with it. It makes it makes him seem neurotic, which I, is important for me. I like it so much more when he there's that point where he thinks. Because he's never, despite the fact that his grandfather calls him Control, and it was like a childhood nickname, he has never introduced himself or referred to him that way. And so I like the idea that it's what Lowry made him introduce mm-hmm. himself as, because Lowry is all about people having their functions and uh, in the quest to defeat Area X. And so him being like, okay, you are not John Rodriguez, you are Control. That is your function. And for him, I don't think of him as control. As, I don't think Lowry had him call himself control in the sense of you are going to be in control, but that you are the control for the experience, experiment. Oh, yeah, that's, that's clever. What I, that's what I took it as metaphorically, mm-hmm. but I didn't realize Lowry, but that makes way more sense uh, in, con- in combination with the introduction of like, he didn't usually introduce himself this way, but and now... Thinking back on it, though, with the whole mind control thing, that makes total sense. Yeah, interesting. I didn't yeah. think of it that way. And, and it, having him as a control that has been on, uh, like the, the neutral party, but unfortunately, he is, let me find out what the has to do with something. That aspect of it, and also these books are a lot more character focused than I realized going in. For some reason, and I don't know why, I thought these books were going to be kind of distant and clinical with the characters but they're really not even in the first book i noticed this there's a lot of work done in terms of the character's personality and their history and um how that how that interacts with the story and that especially is the case for control who you can just you're in his mental space of falling kind of apart feeling oppressed by this whole thing feeling out of his control i read a horror uh, book a few months back called the deep um by nick cutter who wrote another horror book that was good but apparently this one isn't anyway it was it was very good at describing disturbing imagery but it wasn't actually very good at making it feel disturbing because the main character felt so flat and it never really the horror never really influenced his mind and the way he thinks and in that book the the author is very good at describing disturbing imagery, but he's but it's not very disturbing to read because the main character is so flat and kind of boring and his interiority and mental landscape. You don't feel the horror of it from him. It's, you know, to, to compare for a moment, I was mentioning to Maria the other day that a lot of the reasons sex scenes are bad in um, books is because it's a lot of like tab a tab a and slot b you know the good ones are about as much a character moment as any other scene in the book and they're about being in the mentality of the character and that interiority absolutely it's such a turn on that like that's the whole point of like being with someone is being able to see from their perspective their interpretation of those moments yeah and to feel it with them and Horror is the same way. And so in that book, it the horror didn't work oh. because the uh, the character you were just not in the character's head and the character wasn't yeah. experiencing horror more than on a surface level. And in this book, you really get into Control's head and you feel for him and you feel his loss of control. And one of the basic... Ha ha ha, funny. Um, and one of the places this shows up the most is when he's seeing videos of the first team's expedition yeah. into Area X. And it's fucking awful because you just it it describes a few things and what's funny is that if the the visuals of them are not oh that was the other visual that i that sticks with me is the two women with something with the background sky moving and then he realizes it's not the sky it's something else it's a thing the the horizon yeah the entire background is not background it is a thing and the reason it's disturbing is because of how much it fucks with his day afterwards. It fucks with his mind and it fucks with the pros. The pros become like you get a real sense through them of him like 
almost having been like mentally nauseous like he can't think yeah. straight conversations merge Check the seats for change john yeah exactly different parts of it they oh. start un unmoving together and like that is such a more effective way of doing it than and it was a squid creature with no brain like you know what i mean and like again because mm -hmm. the things he's describing are not in and of themselves often horrific but his reaction to them makes yep. our reaction to them horrific and also his trauma being repurposed for this new yes trauma is so human in and of itself that it feels like a psycho you the reader are experiencing a psychotic episode well and thematically Ari x is right all about merging things and changing them and so yeah. his past and present are kind of merging as well right. there's a part where he's in a bar and he overhears two women and the dialogue that they're saying uh, is from the biologist and the survey maria caught that i didn't catch that um in the first book and so you get a sense of like oh the world actually is is not quite real it's it's changing and i love that shit so much i so love that shit and that is what like that that takes so much build up and so much patience and so much good prose to create kind of because my argument would be that the first half of the second book is like two hours too long i think you could achieve much the same thing in less time I think it's one of those things where, like, yeah, and for you it might work better, but I think for Katie and I it works well Perfectly. as it is, and I would not want to lose. I I enjoyed the money. I, like I enjoyed. Yeah. I I, I was liked, bored. and so it's one of those. And that's I the like thing is curry being hungry and him eating curry and, and the, the it made me, cell phone it, that made me anchor into him more yeah. emotionally. <laughs> Yep. I understand that, but I think it could have just been achieved. Like, Vandermeer is a really good writer. Um, and I, I was kind of on board with it pretty quickly. Oh, okay. And so the other thing that's going on during all this paperwork and, and managerial stuff is that he has been interviewing the biologist that returned, which is like, is it a copy of her? Is it not? We don't know because she's a little bit more alive than the other people who came back. The problem is that from a structural point, and I can't remember if I talked about this or not. I think I have. But I also might have moved some of it. Anyway, the first book is like this part of the story has happened up to here. Audio listeners, you're just going to have to interpret what I'm saying through the tone of my voice. And then what happens is that the, the second book is like, OK, but now let's go backwards and figure out what was happening with the Southern Reach this whole time. while only slightly moving forward. What happened with um, the biologist? It starts, it starts the middle the minute it ends. I understand. But what I'm saying is that all of what it's exploring is not about what's happening in Area yeah. X after that point with the biologist. It's essentially exploring what's going on with Southern Reach. What's going on with headquarters? What's going on with the, you know the things I that read, happened earlier? I read literally, what if that, uh, like, I read the first book as literally the way a biologist, like, it's a, it's a story about biology, about nature, about things. And the second one is literally a spy story. Because he's a spy. And yes, and then the third one is, if anything, Saul at heart. Like poetic, disjointed, uh, prophetic. So the thing about it is that to me, there's a lack of narrative momentum to it. And that's part of why I think that section drags on so long, because the second half, something big does happen and move this the plot, so to speak, forward. I think also it, it, it's melding a little bit with the third book, which goes back even farther than the second book. It's one of the things we said about Hyperion was that as the stories go on, they're actually more about backfilling the world and what happened before the current yes, plot. Then and what goes forward. Right. And that was something where um, I thought the author did it really well and it worked. And here I didn't feel like it worked quite as well in terms of in that one, you're learning things that really propel the greater stakes of why they're on this journey. Whereas in this one, the, a lot of the stuff that's revealed, you could kind of interpolate. I, I, I just don't see it as that. I don't know. It's not even the same beast in my mind. Like what you just said about Hyperion was 100% true and perfect and like a, a, a beautiful analysis, uh, analysis nice. of nice. what it, you know, like you know what it's doing. But that's not what this book is. This book's and yeah, I don't think that's what it's of a creature. Yeah, it's I don't like think a portrait that's... of a creature from multiple perspectives. Well, but maybe because it's not doing the same thing, it doesn't work as well. Again, I felt like, so take Lowry, for example. 
what what's really the point of Lowry? He adds a little thematically, but a lot of time is spent on him. He's the spy. His point is what he does for the director, and I think exactly the director would not be who she is, and her her career would not be what it is without that. Also, what he represents as the terror of uh, the the Humanity. fear of yes, we can hear you. The fear of Area X. He is the embodiment of all the fear and reactive and antagonistic uh, uh, ideas of humanity towards things we don't understand and that we're scared of. Versus the director, who is coming from a much more uh, less antagonistic. Like she wants to change mm -hmm. things, but she's not out to hurt. And so I think Lowry is super important. And while I do agree that perhaps the second book could have been shorter and some people would have enjoyed it that way, I don't think, I don't see it as a going backwards. I see it as moving, like, I see it as successfully backfilling as far as what has been happening in the Southern Reach, but it doesn't feel like a pause for me in the plot. It doesn't feel like a also, pause in the momentum. It, it felt, it was gripping. I wanted to know what was happening and the power dynamics between Lowry, uh, Severance, and uh, the Grace. director and... <laughs> learning uh and grace yeah. learning well, all like of that was amazing lowry was the antagonist of the spy world as well you know like what i mean like mm -hmm. he's he's the if anything he's the root of connection between reality and not reality because of like the madness that he still harbors and also he's the crawler but in a different form i think the thing about it is that if you read the first book the sort of thesis statement of it or the plot lines that it sets up are the story of the biologist and what's ha what what she's the forward movement of her what with the mystery of area x and the thematics of you know annihilation and i think what happens is that when you then go and decide that the second and third book are going to be about other the, uh, something other than those three those three things don't really move forward through a character like lowry or even the director I think it was about the mystery of Area X. The, Lowry, it the was. director was all about the mystery of Area X. And yep. I think Lowry is as well. I mean, Lowry is the sort of one of They're the, the only human living perspective. Survivors. They're yeah. the human perspective of the whole experience beyond control himself. So I like, do agree that the story of the biologist stops, but I think the mystery of Area X is the heart of the second book, just from a bureaucratic lens. I don't yeah. think so, because right I, I, I get the sense, I, I understand that that's the focus, but we don't learn anything new about Area X, really, in the second book. That's it's still an assimilating, well, okay, but then you have a book that doesn't have, like, much of a, Point, if you're saying it that I way we, i think we do learn about it we learned that it has spit back people differently that it we already knew that expedition no we we didn't we i don't mean that they spit back people differently that but that every time people come back they are slightly like it is different things sometimes people don't come back when lowry came back he didn't come back as copy of lowry he came back as Lowry, mm -hmm. he was alive. We learned that there were several expeditions where people came back just fine. Then they stopped coming back at all. Then they started coming back as copies. The first copies died, but then uh, the, these other ones aren't dying. What is happening with that? Area X yes. is, te is, is Area X testing or is Area X, X reacting? Is it antagonistic or is it defensive? All of that is being explored, and I think it says so much to... And I also think it's really important for the sake of anchoring the story in reality. Like, uh, the entire the, the entire pantomime of, like, bureaucracy in the second book is supposed to, I think, bring us more into, oh, yeah, this is our world. Like, we're living in it, and this is the thing. It, it, without the mundanity of uh, Chorizo and some of the other things, and without the almost like saccharine sweet portrayal like like uh pan like just like super like almost a caricature of like ooh spies cia all of that like i think that's supposed to supposed to not only you know obviously there's a message in that but like beyond that message it's connecting us to what we would expect of our government's reaction to something like this and therefore create this kind of weird like empathy between what's happening in this world and in ours. It's, it's supposed to make us feel like we're connected. I also don't think this is a plot driven story at all. 
I, I don't no. think that's the purpose of it at all. I, uh, I understand. I understand that's not the author's project, but from the first book, you are expecting this to at least have some kind of forward movement. And I don't agree that, I don't really agree that we learned that much about the new, this, the, the shimmer or the, the zone from the second book. We do learn some things, but like, People come back from it different. Yeah, it's a creepy zone that changes people. Even the videotapes that he saw, those are so creepy, but like, okay, creepy things happen in the zone. Like, and, and a lot of time is spent. I don't think that's what the first book is setting up. I, as someone who's read it twice, at no point did I go into the, like even the first time I didn't go into the second book going, oh, what is, I frankly, I thought the first book was a perfect closure. I thought that was the end. It was. Like it, that there, there, and, and that, there is no forward momentum at the end of the second book. There is nothing. Yeah. There is simply annihilation. And that by going back and showing how the human world is reacting, it is continuing the story that could not have been continued any other way. It's like when you, like the end of Stranger Things season one, is it, it, it never should have had a sequel. They started to uh. it up. And so I don't think at the end of the first book that any of that is like needed to be explored. Like, I See, I, I fundamentally disagree. To me, it felt like, okay, and then what happens next after this? No. Because it yeah, ends I with her go saying, I'm not gonna go home. And then in the next book, she's home. Like that creates a certain amount of like, oh my God, what's happening? And in terms of reaction to the, to the Area X, yeah, it's reacting. The book is about the human reaction to Area X, but it's not actually following on from the plot of the first book. Her coming back doesn't suddenly spark a lot of changes or even the director dying doesn't spark well, it kind of sparks some changes, but it doesn't. It, and her coming back literally opens a portal back into Area X. Like, yeah, well, but I'm talking about the first half of the book. The second half of the book does suddenly move a lot of things forward. But in the first half of the book, again, I, I didn't really feel like we were learning anything vital to the rest of the story. I, I, think I really think it's a lot with control, though. So I think, I think the important. problem, I think the problem is that Katie and I had a fundamental different reading of the end of the first book than you did. Because again, both times that I've read it, I'm like, it's done. Because it, for yeah. me, it ends with her being like, I am assimilating into, I yeah. it, like, I am just going to be part it of the space. It read a short story. Yeah, and it was just done. Like, I read it as a clean cut ending. I, I frankly, the first time I finished it, I was like, there's a sequel? what are we doing and then yeah. i was okay with the sequel because it wasn't continuing the biologist story and by the time we got the in the third book where we get the biologist uh and the end of her story it wasn't about what happened to her after the end of the first book it was about uh it, like something slightly different and it more about contextualizing what Ghostbird needed to find out than yeah. uh, about the biologist herself. So for me, the first book ended and I was like, that's done. So I think that's the, I think that's the difference. And I think that's why you feel this way versus Katie and I. And I think that's going to depend on how you as a reader come to the book and how you finish the first book. Yeah, because I felt like uh, during the first half of the second book, I was like, okay, let's get, let's figure out what happens next. I'm, I'm kind of impatient. I'm waiting for this to happen. And I think that that view of the series though means yeah. that the whole thing is kind of just meandering. Like we're not yeah. really moving. <laughs> See, like yeah. right there, that's a fundamental difference then is that yes, it kind of feels it like it's meandering around without like yep. a like point. So in this, yep. in this version of meandering, I like this person's meandering. I don't like everyone's meandering, but I like this one. Because I, I think this is conscious meandering. I think this is meandering yeah. that is exploring different facets of uh, a phenomenon. He wanted to explore something specific. Like I, From he completely wanted to explore different vantage the points. feeling, the feeling of horror of something other, but also not other. Like the Uncanny Valley, literally verbatim for the <laughs> definition of Uncanny Valley. I think that's fair. I think that's the author's project is he just wanted to keep talking about this world after the first book. But I think, you know, like, I think I would have enjoyed the second book so much more if it was the first one I had read, because then I would have been like, oh, what's this creepy stuff going on? What's going on here and there? Oh, oh, oh. That's interesting. Right? And I, I think I think that it's interesting because I think different readers I think would be reversible. Yeah, I think yeah. different readers would prefer it in a different order. Like, I think for I Katie think and I... I the way our really framework. That, yes. Yeah. I, think, I think it would be fascinating. <laughs> I wish I could go back and reread the second, like do the second book first read instead the of the second book first. First book, I could see either way of it working though, depending so, on who you are. What you said earlier, Katie, about um, it, the dividends he gets from putting those last two perspectives, um, the director and Saul in the third book, making them feel more lonely. 
I get that. I don't, I wouldn't agree with doing it that way. I think you lose more than you gain. But I think in the second book, you don't gain anything from putting it after the first book. So I think that's kind of a, a, a difference there is that he does get uh, things from doing it in the third book that I he doesn't. I disagree. Really? What does I he get love, from putting I it after? I loved knowing more than John. Yeah. Me too. Oh, I loved knowing more than him. I loved. Sad. And, and also, you do get a little bit of helplessness, yeah. You get this feeling of like, this is a tragic story that's always going to play out the same way, no matter how you read it. But nonetheless, it's really well done. Like, it makes you, it's like a happy cry. It's like, you know, in Dune, where they tell you the house of Atreides is going to fall mm -hmm. at yeah. the start of the book. Yeah. Um, and I hated that when I started reading it. And then I was like, oh, okay, I, I see what you're doing because <coughs> we're expecting it. We're paying so much attention to the mm -hmm. tiny steps that are leading us there. Um, and so for me, it was also like seeing the struggle between grace and then back reading everything I knew about the psychologist into the Maybe understanding of Cynthia, Cynthia and the and grace as like uh, friends and partners. And then getting that backfilled again in the third book and feeling like by the time the third book is done, I have such a like whole understanding of the characters yeah. and the players and yet at the same time they feel don't know themselves yes but at the same time feeling like i still don't understand yeah so much and like because you do get an explanation of why area x is here but mm -hmm. at the same time there is a sense of like incompleteness for my soul yes. and and yeah. so no i i didn't the entire first half of the the second book i i liked knowing more than him i liked knowing what happened to the psychologist slash Cynthia. I wonder if it's because it makes us feel like uh, godlike in uh, the ability to like kind of like God staring down know, upon us. I know the futility that everything you are doing is futile, and I also but like it's beautiful the, nonetheless in yep. the fact that you still like you, you're things. still seeing things, doing things. I, I don't know. I just think this is such a masterful trilogy. <laughs> it's like when you see about the people in Pompeii. And like how many of them were just doing normal things like the yeah. world was ending but yeah. a lot of them just chose not to run like there's literally people jacking off yeah and it's like it's the the things are coming down and it's great because what you don't realize in the second book is that there are people who know how bad things actually are yeah. right now yeah and they've thrown john into this chaos and yeah. john is just trying to do the things as the water is slowly coming up around him. You, I think you would still get that though, even if this was the first one you read. I mean, I think there's a few things that would be I out agree. of place, but- I, I, think that, I think that you would get. I think you yeah. would get that he's drowning. Yeah. For me, I like knowing more. I like what reading, like I, I didn't I know. I lose heard, anything. Yeah, yeah I yeah, didn't yeah. lose but anything. But I think that's just literally how Almost we like it's down to your chemical, the way your brain chemically perceives. I agree. Things. The the terroir that has created you. The terroir, yeah. exactly. What is your reading experience? What is uh, the books you have read? What has that turned you into as a reader and a digester of information? Oh. And I think your mine and Katie's is much more aligned. That that is something endemic to people. I don't want to say you as a reader, but you do have always said you like more like. Uh, slice of life things well, and so that's kind of a thing day. whereas I like things that are like more like this is the one thing we're going to talk about and then we're going to fully explore the idea whereas to me again this just felt I literally just was kept being like all right let's let's move it along let's let's get back to figuring out what's happening with the area x whereas he's backfilling outward and so I yeah I do think I guess that is I think it's a bit like with the tension in the first one in that to me it felt like he was setting up a situation that he then didn't deliver on and if he hadn't set up that situation I wouldn't in terms of if he hadn't set that up I hadn't read the first book I would be okay with where this was going but because I felt like it was set up it was um incomplete to me okay we're already at two and a half hours. Um, okay. And okay. we've part of it is we 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 got started really late. Okay. But like, do you guys do you guys want to go for another hour, or do you want to just talk about the second half of the book and the third book on a like a Monday or something? Like, do you guys just want to split this into two episodes, or I'm I'm happy to split it into two episodes. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk about the the third book. And also, Will, how did you like good. the third book as a whole? I thought it was the weakest uh, because it literally is the most that's like. I kept expecting, you know, at the end of um, Piperian, Katie said that she really wanted like a matchup with the Shrike, like something to come yeah. of that. And in this one, I kept being like, all right, we're going to see the director again. All right, all this Saul stuff is going to go places. See, and never felt that it way. never has any impact yeah. on the plot. Like, the, there's. It didn't bother me here. Again, though. it was more just about the characters and their journey. Why even have the, the, the part with Control and Ghostbird then? 
Like it has nothing to do with the. Oh, no. uh, for me, because it's an acceptance of Area X is going to change the world. We can change with it, or we can be annihilated by it. Yeah, that's what and I they thought chose. Too. Yeah, and they have chosen to change with it. And Grace and her are joyously walking back into the world, and the idea that this thing has now there because what I took it as is that by jumping through that hole, he has now become a part of yeah. humanity has now become yeah. a part of whatever area X yeah. is. This yeah. is the, this is the root that planted the flower. He has now entered into and accepted. And now area X is like the world's going to fucking change. Yes. Uh, dear listeners, my rebuttal will be in the next episode. Thank you for joining us. Why don't you sign us out, Maria, so that just in case I use this as its own episode, we have it. Okay. Thanks for watching. Bye, guys.